All right, it's uh, time for the second part of our um, COVID-19 symposium. I'm going to share the screen again with our slideshow. I just want to remind people that everyone comply with the code of conduct, and you can see the QR code here if you're not familiar with it. Um, again, please, if you have questions, ask them in the Q&A uh, feature, not in the chat. If you are a panelist, uh, you can add your question to the document that um, Tommy has um, provided, uh, the online document. And you can find that here under with this QR code or with the link either on the slide or in the chat. And it would be nice if everyone that is participating in this, in this um, symposium could add their name and institution into the um, document. And if you have any kind of stories about what happened at your institution in your museum and your collection during the pandemic, please add it or just add questions to any of the talks uh, that we added in there, add it under the specific talk you wanna ask questions. And we're gonna share that later with the um, people that gave the talks and they will be uh, happy to answer your questions, I'm sure. Our next speaker is going to be Jennifer Sassel. Um, can you turn your camera on Jennifer and just, say hello, and um, she's gonna talk about ensuring the visibility, relevance, and community connectedness of natural history collections during a global health crisis. Hello, everyone. I'm Jen Zaslow, and I'm a research curator and head of the zoology department at the Milwaukee Public Museum. Before I get started, I wanna take a moment to thank my co-authors, Katja Seltman, Julie Allen, and Kat Sullivan. I also want to thank the symposium organizers for the invitation to share my experiences in overseeing the zoology collections at NPM and managing a large digitization project during the global pandemic. The current global health crisis has created new challenges for natural history collections and collections-based researchers. Before I jump into how NPM and our associated collections have been dealing with these COVID-related issues, I wanted to share a little bit about NPM pre-COVID for those that may not be familiar with our institution. The Milwaukee Public Museum has been around a long time. It first opened to the public in 1884. NPM houses over 4 million objects and specimens. We have collections in anthropology, botany, geology, history, and zoology. We have over 150,000 square feet of exhibit space, plus 80,000 square feet for events and traveling exhibits. NPM serves 550,000 visitors across the state and beyond annually, including 150,000 school children throughout the state on field trips and over 25,000 through a variety of community outreach events and programs. On March 14th at 5 p.m., the NPM officially closed due to the public health crisis. Collections and research had roughly two weeks to close up shop, secure and protect all equipment and specimens and gather any materials needed for remote working environments. And so that's exactly what we did. Here you can see a picture of our invertebrate zoology laboratory where we covered all of our microscopes, our macropod imaging system, and any associated computer equipment. On the right is one of our digitization technicians, Charla Reprogli, in her at-home digi setup where she is barcoding slide-mounted specimens for our parasite digitization project. Despite the abrupt loss of access to our collections and research spaces, and also suspension of public programming, we managed to have a relatively productive quarter and moved forward on specimen imaging, uh, remote data transcription and cleaning. Uh, we also set up a synthetic uh, symbiota portal, um, so records currently housed in our um, EMU database could be made available online. And this was a really big infrastructure advancement um, for NPM. And so far we have um, records from geology, botany, and some from um, zoology out there. Um, so I encourage you to, to check it out um, if you can. We also spend a significant amount of time working with our education and development departments uh, to figure out ways to stay engaged with our local community uh, and members. And that work still continues as we're still operating on a, a relatively limited basis. 
The museum's limited reopening plan was developed by an internal task force, of course, following guidelines and regulations put forth by the city and the state of Wisconsin. Uh, this task force was developed in spring 2020, um, and we still meet weekly or biweekly as um, the city of Milwaukee continues to monitor and work its way through the various uh, reopening phases. Uh, MPM reopened to the public on August 21st and is now open four days a week. Our capacity is limited to 250 people in the building at a time, including staff, and this is uh, controlled largely with the newly implemented electronic ticketing and timed entry system. Visitors can tour a limited number of exhibits with traffic operating in one direction. Uh, we're not currently hosting any traveling exhibits and the cafeteria, gift shops, and butterfly vivarium are all closed. Of course, masks and social distancing are mandatory. And these are um, a couple of examples of some of the signs um, that our marketing department um, developed just showing um, you know, the various policies um, that our um, visitors must follow if they're gonna be um, in the museum. Access is still very limited for CNR staff. For the most part, um, we are going in just one day a week. Uh, we're spreading people out across different days, um, trying to have people come in on the days that we are closed um, to the public. Other uh, public uh, programming um, departments are in a similar situation, uh, for the most part, offering experiences um, to schools in the community um, virtually. So while the business of reopening to the public continues to move forward, what about the business of research and digitization uh, for MPM collections and departments? Uh, for me in zoology, um, the bulk of our department um, has been heavily focused on moving the terrestrial parasite tracker TCN forward. Uh, many of you here are likely involved in this project or are perhaps aware of it, but for those that may not be, I'll give just a couple of highlights uh, briefly. Um, the TPT project is focused on digitizing arthropod parasite collections to trace parasite host associations and uh, predict the spread of vector-borne disease. Um, this project started in September um, 2019, so we're just starting um, project uh, period uh, year two. We have 28 participating institutions, um, 34 PIs and uh, leads on subawards. Uh, for a total of 110 uh, participants. Um, our digitization objectives include transcribing and georeferencing label data from just over a million arthropod parasite specimens uh, from 23 collections across North America. Uh, we also plan to document 500,000 parasite host associations uh, via the Global Biotic Interactions uh, or GLOBI website. Uh, we've got a picture here of the TPT network. This was taken at a workshop that we um, had at the Field Museum last February, just before um, the COVID shutdowns, um, which was uh, really lucky that we got that we were able to sneak that in uh, before folks were no longer able to travel. Uh, and the graphic below um, is a generalized workflow for the project showing the different database platforms our providers are using, uh, with SCAN being the primary aggregator for TPT. So given the complexity of the project and the fact that each institution is doing something a little different, um, depending on size and scope of their parasite holdings and the database being used, we put together an organizational chart. Um, and so this is kind of our roadmap to who is involved in the project along with their role. Um, we also have a corresponding spreadsheet um, that has all the contact information uh, for everyone you see here, and we update that with new hires or other staffing changes. So I think the big question here for this talk, um, in the context of COVID and its impact on our collection space work, is how do you make progress on a project like this when we can't be in our collections with our specimens? Because the situation really was, still is, unprecedented and everything shut down so quickly, we were really only able to react first and make plans later. Um, for TPT, we sent out an initial email with some general guidance around what kind of work could be done remotely and how to best try and keep current staff employed on this project. Um, that was really priority one. We didn't want to lose anybody along the way. We also used a time where we weren't digitizing as much as we would have liked to work on 
polishing workflows, developing new workflows. Uh, we finished uh, manufacturing scanning trays and distributed them to our uh, collaborators within the network. We gathered taxonomy resources for arthropod parasites and started formatting spreadsheets and names lists across the different um, uh, platforms. Um, a, a lot of work still ongoing there. That's perhaps a, a separate presentation. Um, we spent a significant amount of time putting together guidelines for parasite host association, transcription and translation, complete with a glossary of terms and definitions um, that can be used to document species interaction data from specimen labels. And we hosted a webinar on this topic in July, um, and there's a publication on it um, up on Zenodo. Um, if, if interested, just shoot me an email. Um, we now have over 450,000 interaction records on the Globe website, uh, which is just under our goal of 500,000 for the entire project period. So we're really um, excited that we were able to get all those um, interactions up um, during the, the closures. And a, sum, a summary of uh, what interactions are used and how um, some of these collections are being indexed in Globe uh, can be viewed um, by going to this um, link at the bottom of, of this slide. And if you visit this link, um, this is what you uh, will see. Um, this is sort of a little preview for those that might be interested. Um, keeping in mind, Globe is a tool that indexes species interaction data sets, and we're using it um, for TPT to create linkages between host parasite association records um, in the literature and even um, um, associations um, on specimen records themselves. And this is a figure showing um, Globe collection status for the TPT institutions. You can see um, most of the collections are, are set up. They're showing in green. We still have some um, that we're working on, but any event green means go and that Globe is able to interact with your data. And you can click on those buttons um, and produce um, different kinds of reports uh, about the data um, that, um, that you've entered and that's been indexed. Managed by TPT Copii Julie Allen, um, a total of 20 expeditions of images from um, Parasite Tracker have been run through Notes from Nature um, for label data transcription. Um, we have over 7,500 specimens completed by over 22,000 transcriptions. Uh, we also have 11 expeditions focused on extended specimen data, including counting, um, numbers of specimens on slides and finding uh, host information. And the slides that you see here on this slide are showcasing a recent expedition set up for some of the slide collection at the University of Minnesota. Um, this has been um, a really successful um, pipeline for us, um, especially given um, all the folks working from home or who have been from working from home and, and are continuing to do so. As most of the collections in our network had to move to remote work environments, uh, we placed emphasis on keeping students and technicians active in the project through remote digitization setups. Um, as I mentioned, this was very um, important to us um, to keep people involved. Um, and most of our data providers have been able to retain their technicians in a remote capacity um, during the last several months. Um, and many of these remote setups were showcased in our TPT newsletters that we sent out um, during the time many universities and museums were closed or operating on a very limited basis. And um, these are a few pages taking, taken from some of those newsletters um, showing um, new hires and, um, and also interesting discoveries that people were finding as they were digitizing their collections. It was really encouraging to see our community pivot and keep this work moving forward. So finally, I just wanted to say that I think our community um, as a whole has done a really excellent job of showcasing our commitment to collections-based science. And we've demonstrated the importance of collections in the work that we do as biodiversity uh, researchers during a public health crisis. And I think it's becoming more apparent every day that not only are natural history collections necessary infrastructure for research and education, but also have great potential to help solve societal challenges and urgent global issues. Um, and this is a slide showing um, several uh, publications that have come out um, in the last year in bioscience along these lines. Um, if you haven't taken a look at um, this special collections collection from bioscience, um, I encourage you to do so. It's, it's very 
very impactful. With that, I'm out of time, so I want to thank uh, funders and collaborators ECN and you for listening. Um, I could take questions in the chat um, if there is a, a, a minute or so left. Um, otherwise, I'd be happy to chat over email, phone, or schedule a virtual meeting. Um, please feel free to reach out. Thanks. Um, thank you, Jennifer, for a very nice talk. Um, I was wondering, I don't know, can you turn your camera on? Uh, I was wondering, since you are in charge of the project, can can you tell us how you see how it in, uh, impacted all the other people that you work with on this TPT? I mean, it's got like all the different um, organizations must have been impacted very differently from yours. True. Yes, I would say um, the institutions participating in TPT have all been impacted in different ways. Um, for example, uh, many of the, the uh, universities that are participating in TPT, those research collections, um, I think what we're seeing is uh, they are able to, um, to get back into their collections or they, they've been able to get back in a little bit sooner than some of the folks working in the larger natural history museums. Um, and so that's, that's one difference. I think, um, you know, that being said, we, we do have some museums that, you know, their research and collections have opened back up again and, and some universities where access is still very limited. So, you know, it really is a case by case thing. And what we've offered to our network is, you know, support in developing sort of a reboot plan and figuring out, you know, if numbers need to be adjusted, if, if goals need to be, you know, reconsidered and just, you know, to be sure that everybody is, is feeling good about their productivity and, and how we can maybe, um, you know, help them come up with creative solutions for, for getting more work done in the event that they continue to run into these staffing issues. Uh, there are a lot of folks, whether you're at a university or a museum that still can't hire students yet. And so that's been a really big challenge for, um, for TPT. I'm trying to figure out how we can work our way through that. Thank you. And uh, if you have any more questions, please use the Q&A or the um, Word document and Jennifer will be happy to answer those. And next, we're going to go with my co-organizer, um, Tommy McElrath, and he's going to talk about what he did at the INHS during the pandemic. I'd like to talk today about accidental pandemic preparation. Updating the digital infrastructure at the INHS Insight Collection allowed us to stay productive during the COVID-19 lockdown and more importantly, build community. I'd like to acknowledge that the INHS Insect Collection is on the lands of the Peoria, Miami, Sauk, Kickapoo, and Potawatomi nations, and holds specimens collected on the lands of many other native peoples. These lands were the traditional territory of these native nations prior to their forced removal, and they continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. The NHS Insect Collection is located about two hours south of Chicago and on the campus of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the Natural Resources Building. We hold about 7 million specimens in total in three different kinds of storage classes. But more importantly, we have many people working in the collection. Myself, my hourlies, uh, students in various groups, uh, including those who have been hired for the Trustful Parasite Tracker, TCN, as well as volunteers who come and work in the collection. After 160 years of collecting uh, at the INHS Insect Collection, um, along with 30 years of digitization, digitization we have 3.5 or sorry, 2.52 million digitized specimens, with 4.42 million estimated remaining still to be digitized. Our holdings are worldwide in scope, with a focus on North America and Illinois, along with several other regional hotspots. And numerous of our orders have been completely digitized, including our Hymenoptera, Hemiptera, uh, EPT orders, and uh, and uh, orthoptera. However, several groups, especially the beetles and lepidoptera and diptera, uh, remain to be digitized. About a year ago, in November 2019, we began the process of migrating our data, our digitized data, from three different databases, all of which were semi-local or local access only. Some were only used for one task, and all of whom had no image support whatsoever. This was important thanks to a large image data backlog that we've been generating thanks to a couple of CSBR grants, um, one of which generated over 7,000 slide images and grids like the ones you see on the right, all of which need separated and transcribed, and some of which hold parasite specimens for the terrestrial parasite tracker grant. Another uh, CSBR grant after that had generated over 61,000 
uh, images of vial mounted specimens of labels on stages, all of which need to transcribed as well. So in November of last year, a custom script written by using a custom script written by Matt Yoder and Dmitry Dmitriev, uh, we migrated our data to TaxonWorks, uh, which was uh, that migration had been tested and refined for the previous one year, along with a synergistic parallel uh, development of required features in TaxonWorks. A little less than a million collection objects were migrated, including associated to collecting event, people, loan, load objects, georeference, locality, and container tables. I don't have time to go into all the features of TaxonWorks here, but it handles images, documentation, tags, and more. You can use custom tasks to accelerate workflow productivity. It's accessible via web interface and API endpoints, and has robust data table relationships and a code base, and it's open source. Any of the, uh, in the rest of the talk, if you see the TaxonWorks logo, um, it's, it indicates that either the data or the images were generated within a TaxonWorks tasks or via the API. So from November of 2019 to February of 2020, uh, we uh, new, new daily users of the database, including myself and my hourlies, reported issues and bugs through the TaxonWorks GitHub repository, which led to those developers immediately squashing a bunch of productivity killing bugs, as well as addressing some of the issues that happened when we migrated all of that data. And so in February of last year, I was uh, feeling ready and slick to use our cool new collection management system to start to digitize all the things. Of course, in March, we all know what happened. The question, of course, immediately uh, once everything started happening in March was how do we support all of the people at INHS through the work that can happen in TaxonWorks? So we developed four different projects that allows, allowed uh, all these different hourlies and um, people to work in the collection, even though they couldn't physically be there. The first project is one I worked on myself, and this was uh, mounting beetle backlog, and I call this defining normal, um, mostly based on this image I, uh, I took when I was uh, starting to rehydrate specimens. After I rehydrated a bunch of backlog beetle specimens that had previously been mounted in envelopes or old sewing containers, um, I digitized and labeled all these specimens and included the images of the original collecting event labels, as you can see there in the middle image, and actually added these to the TaxonWorks database as uh, metadata depictions of collecting events. Uh, furthermore, I labeled a bunch of backlog specimens, and I, yes, I know this is not a beetle, but there were a lot of backlog specimens that didn't have labels and had been mounted many years previous, and we actually found their collecting event data in the database after it was migrated. We matched it to existing locality records. We were able to finally add labels to those specimens. Um, and this is one of the only images I have of those particular specimens. And of course, those were then databased and put in TaxonWorks. Finally, I took the last drawer out of a long-standing 2019 project of identifying the 80 plus drawers of unidentified beetles to family, um, and I finished identifying those. I took that home, um, added two new families to the collection, and uh, used Twitter as a resource to not only um, keep me connected with the community, but to help identify beetles. One of these was a weird malirid, uh, the Vinicius Fer Ferriera pointed me in the right direction towards. He actually pointed me to a resource across the globe during the middle of a lockdown, Atlas of Living Australia, which had a type photo of this species. And of course, I then database this specimen in taxon work as well. Next was a really cool chrysomelid uh, in, that was originally labeled with the label not serendipity. And what was interesting about this was that three different experts on Twitter um, those right there actually helped me get this down to the right genus, and then I helped, and then I uh, identified it to species. Um, but I was able to record their determinations in the database natively and include depictions of their determinations uh, as uh, an image class within TaxonWorks. Finally, I'd just like to show this beautiful little iridescent dryopid uh, that brought lots of people together, both with comments about how pretty it was, but also with identifications. And during the peak of lockdown, this was key um, in to, to my own mental health and getting myself reconnected with a community, even though I felt so isolated. So I wrapped up project one in about June of 2020 with about 3,500 specimens mounted, labeled and databased and put into TaxonWorks. All of these were identified, uh, all the beetles were identified to family, including the 320 most difficult coleopter specimens out of all those unidentified um, beetles. And as of um, June of 2020, there are no more pinned unsorted coleoptera in the INHS insect collection. Um, and these were eventually put away in the inset collection. Project two was our slide scan backlog, which uh, myself and two hourlies tackled over the course of March to July, where we broke down those 7,000 different scan slide tray images using the grid digitizer task in TaxonWorks to create 45,000 different slide depictions and individual collection objects with identifiers. 
This included our one millionth digitized collection object, this THRIPS that was included in standards THRIPS of Illinois and has some of the only host data uh, of that species uh, in Illinois. Project three was uh, generating data for the Trustal Parasite Tracker uh, TCN grant um, and getting all four of my hourlies busy on that. They had previously generated images prior to the uh, lockdown and got busy transcribing those both uh, verbatim and then parsing out the data. Um, and in addition, project two actually fed into uh, more images for them to transcribe um, as we added Im uh, images of slide mounted fleas and lice and other uh, terrestrial parasites. Um, this was done through two tasks in TaxonWorks, the transcription task and then a parsing task. Um, as it stands right now, we have about 17,590 specimens uh, ready to go, or at least started ready to go for the TPT project, with another 49,000 49, left to go, um, but we're well on the way and many different groups are proceeding nicely. Project four brought in even more community. We took, uh, we took advantage of some of the volunteers who were stuck at home and asked them to help us transcribe a lot of specimens. In addition, we actually got help from um, uh, several INHS employees who volunteered their time because their research projects were either canceled or postponed and they had nothing else to do. So I did several Zoom training webinars and trained them on one of our particular transcription tasks. And in one month, we transcribed over 10,000 images in the TaxonWorks database. Managing this community was a task all of its own, but I used standard operating procedures um, and shared those wildly. We did weekly stand-up meetings with my uh, hourlies and even with some of the um, volunteers and other employees. We documented issues and bugs whenever we found them. And I always tried to encourage questions and did quick Zoom troubleshooting sessions. But the standard operating procedures really helped guide the entire community through this process. Including when we returned in July, 2020, um, after the uh, advent of UIUC mandated testing, we staggered the return to the insect collection with, uh, leading up to one person in one room at any one time. Um, and at this point, uh, most hourlies work one day in the collection, which uh, generates images for them to work on or transcribe at home. What's really cool is you can actually see the process of working during the pandemic using the collection object work report task in TaxonWorks. Um, you can see this one user here started work in March, very uh, little work being done in the actual collection uh, database, but then uh, ramps up all the way to peaking in June, July, and August with a, then a dip as more time is spent in the collection itself once she was return, approved to return to the insect collection. Furthermore, you can see different groups of users actually using the database. Um, you can see different kinds of specimens being updated by my hourlies, by the TPT students, by our volunteers, by uh, the uh, Care and Curation of Entomology Collections class I taught this semester, um, as well as myself and developers actually uh, updated, all of these people together updated 86,000 specimens during the pandemic. So our projects, two of which have been finished, are, are, are two of which are still ongoing, um, we're all successes during a pandemic lockdown. But why does this all matter? It matters because we all share a common goal during a very difficult time. Whether you're uh, an hourly or a student uh, who are working with specimens or volunteers contributing to transcriptions, whether you're a developer who built the database in the first place, whether you're outside scientists who are contributing to the identification or the curation of those specimens, or even if you're a member of the outside community who happens to get involved, we all care about those specimens. And our collection management system fosters that community. And we'd like to expand that in the coming years as we build up this product that is the INHS Insect Collection. So it takes a community to build a collection and a good collection management system fosters and supports that community, especially during a pandemic. And I hope yours does too. I will take any questions. Thank you, Tommy. Um, you must be the only collection in the world that has no beetle backlog now, I would think. Um, no, and I think we should- I did mention um, the, um, the wet mounted specimens. There's still multiple cabinets full of beetles I need to identify. Maybe you should um, answer the last question you did in the Q&A, maybe live. And um, Christine asked, a common thread of many talks is migration from older databases. How confident are you that the new system will have longevity? And or to put it in another way, is if a collection is starting from scratch with limited resources, where should they start? That's a great question. Um, and I, I don't think that every like any one particular collection management system is going to fit anyone's needs. Um, like every, all, all of everyone's needs. I don't think that's possible. Everyone's always going to have different kinds of data. 
Um, so I think the two major things you want to do is to think about um, making sure that the database isn't necessarily proprietary. You're not going to be able to get your data in and out. So you don't want to put your data in a form that you're not going to be able to get in and out later. And that's going to ensure that even if you aren't, uh, even if that database doesn't necessarily have uh, longevity, that you can still get the data back out in the end. Um, and then the next thing is just make sure that the database fits your needs. And you should look at a wide variety of different products. And of course, a small collection is gonna have a lot less resources. And so you're probably gonna wanna look at um, databases and systems that uh, are either free or lower cost, but there are a lot of um, collection management systems out there that have a decent community that's uh, supporting you. So, um, so yeah, those are the two things. Uh, make sure it fits your needs and make sure it's either open source or you can get your data in and out easily. Okay. There's one more chat, uh, question in the chat, in the Q&A. Um, you mentioned the indigenous peoples. Uh, what is your lab research doing to give back to them? Any programs to involve them in the work or to incorporate their knowledge? That is a great question. And honestly, I'll, we aren't doing anything yet. Um, this is not really a, a push at our institution yet. And I think it should be. Um, I've been made aware of this issue in the last like year or two um, at different meetings and at different um, uh, other workshops. And so um, it's something I'm starting to work on and I'm starting to think about. Um, and I think it's something the entire collections management community needs to start to think about. Um, and so uh, the, the bad answer is, is that I'm not doing anything yet, but I hope to do that soon. All right, thank you. Um, next up is Jade Badal, and he's going to give us some insight on the Philippine Lepidoptera and what they discovered during the pandemic. Jade Badon or Jaa Badon and I would like to share our discoveries here in the Philippines during the pandemic. So it started with this caterpillar that my collaborator in Palawan found in his property. He took photos and sent it to me and first time to see this kind of caterpillar and I know it belongs to the genus Euplea so I told him to rear it and just take photos of any changes that he observed. So these are some of the photos that he took of this unknown butterfly. Then after a few days we reach to this almost pre-emergence stage. So this is now the pupa almost ready to emerge. And when it emerged, I was surprised because this butterfly is Euplea swineson and it is actually a near threatened butterfly. And this is the first ever documented life history of this species. And this is Jason Apollonio in Palawan. He transformed his aquariums into mini rearing containers. And right now he's documenting caterpillars in his own backyard. A 
From Palawan, let's move to Bohol Island where my other collaborator, Christy Berlis, has been documenting several species of butterflies in her own garden. So he documented several new records and also life histories of some common and rare butterflies. And we have Tristan Cinarillos, our collaborator from Mindanao Island. It's very important that it was in Mindanao Island that we discovered the moth that crawls backwards to mimic an ant. And during this pandemic, children also participated in some documentations of Philippine Lepidoptera in their own gardens. And then here's Linda Alisto, our collaborator in North Luzon, documenting the Philippine Lepidoptera in the mountain regions of Luzon. We also have documentations of Philippine Lepidoptera in Negros Island. So here we have our collaborator Romana de los Reyes. She is a retired professor and now managing her own garden. And she's been documenting several species of Philippine butterflies and moths. Her notable observation during the pandemic is the life history of this sphinx moth in the genus Cephonodus. So you just saw the caterpillars and then the pupa and then the fr freshly emerged adult. So as you can see, the scales are still on the wings, which after a few hours, they will all fell off, leaving with a clear wing. So these are some of the observations that we made during the pandemic. And then there will be more to discover in, let's say, in the, in the future. And in this, this is very essential because these Philippine Lepidoptera are very important in various fields such as education, research, ecotourism, biodiversity, and agriculture. And it is very important to know their existence because they're very important in our ecosystem. They are food for lizards and birds and they also pollinate flowers and other important crops. So they are very important for our food security. So thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed our presentation. And don't forget to like us on Facebook, Philippine Lepidoptera official page, and the Philippine Lepidoptera community pages. That's where we usually upload our daily discoveries and pictures of Philippine Lepidoptera that we documented just outside our garden, our backyard, or in a nearby forest. So again, this is Jade Badon or Ja Badon and thank you for listening. Thank you, Jay. That was an amazing talk and amazing video. Thank you. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on, I think you are 
your community is mainly on Facebook, I think. That's how you get a lot of people submitting stuff to you. Yeah. Um, how often, like, how, how many volunteers do you have that, like, sending in pictures or rearing stuff and, like, giving you new information about all the butterflies in the Philippines? Okay, so uh, last year wasn't that much, but during this pandemic, people shifted into gardening. And that's where we're all you know, kinds of insects and especially caterpillars are feeding on their, on their our plants. So after that, a lot of people are now joining the organization. I think we increased into 1,000 uh, members in our group pages alone. That's because we receive a lot of pictures and images of uh, life histories of Lepidoptera, like almost every day. And then for, for, um, for some of my collaborators, I have, uh, I think, five or four people that are working on documenting the life histories of Philippine Lepidoptera in their own, uh, in their own backyard or in a nearby forest that's from the egg, larva, pupa, until the adults. And we have hundreds of submissions like every month of any, you know, unknown uh, caterpillars that we actually just sold them to rear it. So. Mm -hmm. so yeah that's what happened yeah i think it's across the board like on iNaturalist the amount of submission has just gone up so much this year um there's another question in the q a okay. what are the biggest issues uh deforestation urbanization what, what other issues do you have in the philippines yeah it's for the usual habitat loss something like that and then uh of course it's the changing of course we, have, we know about the climate change because things have been changing here, especially the weather. And then we have these typhoons. And then we just had this, uh, a super typhoon that recently affected an island that we just documented more than 100 new locality records of butterflies. So hopefully after this, we can do a follow-up on how, if they're still there and follow-up research on the documentation of, documentation of what, what's left on the island. So we're trying to try to, uh, try to analyze the recovery of those, uh, of those butterflies and moths that we documented. So yeah, it's again, habitat loss. And that, that's pretty much I can say. Okay. And uh, there's another question, what the situation for collecting permits are in okay. the Philippines? The current situation of collecting permits is, um, it's difficult. I mean, I applied for a permit and I haven't gotten it for almost maybe two years now. I don't know what's happening. So for my current research right now, we are working through collaborators nationwide so that they can just, they can document the life histories in their own gardens. And then some also, uh, ours, our collection is, pretty scattered around the Philippines, but we have the main collection in the National Museum in Manila, so. Okay, and um, there's one more question about a species name in the Q&A, if you could answer it there, and then. Oh, uh, um, it was the Saphonotus hylas. Okay, and then we have to move on to our last talk for the symposium. And we're moving from the Philippines to uh, Indonesia now and Peggy is going to give us a talk that is actually a mix of what happened in her museum during COVID and kind of like a little museum tour. So we end the, we started the day with museum tours and we're going to end the day with another museum tour kind of. So Chris. Hello, greetings to all of you. My name is Peggy. I'm a butterfly researcher and curator at Entomology Laboratory. Museum Zoological Bogorians, Indonesia. I'm so grateful for this opportunity to present working on data mobilization of butterfly collections at Museum Zoological Bogorians, Indonesia, supported by BIFADZB during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our museum has been holding collections of various Indonesian animal taxa since 1894. The MCB collections were originally situated at Bokor Botanic Garden Complex. With the increased need for more space and better condition for the specimens, 
we moved from this historic uh, place in Bogor to newly built facility in Chibinom, thanks to GEF, World Bank, and Data Funds. The butterfly collections at MCD include specimens in about 130 cabinets and about 58,000 specimens estimated. Earlier in 2019, I secured the Biodiversity Information Funds for Asia, BIFA grant, administered by the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, GBIF, to do data mobilization of all swallowtail butterflies at MCD and a few other butterfly taxa that of significant importance. I located endemic protected. The page describing our project is available at this time. It is a very major and important undertaking for us. We apply QR code system into data management of MCD butterfly collection. The processes of specimen data registration include giving QR code to each specimen mounted and unmounted, entering data on specimen labels to spreadsheets on computer, taking photographs of upper side and underside of the butterfly, all with the associated labels. The work of data mobilization includes capturing or recording data, interpreting data, georeferencing, cleaning and checking data, and uploading or publishing data to GBIF and to our system. We were doing the final phase of the project of putting the well-curated, registered, and well-arranged specimens back into the cabinets when the COVID-19 pandemic hit us and forced us to work from home. During the three-month work limitation, we could not go to the office at all. We could not access the specimens. Thus, most works were disrupted. Starting mid-June 2020, we resume our work at the collection, but only twice a week and later on uh, three days a week. And we have to comply with all the standard procedure. Wear masks all the time, wash hands often, maintain physical distance, limit the number of workers to only 20% of the room capacity, avoid closed room with poor ventilation, avoid crowds, avoid direct contact. But inevitably, we have to be in air-conditioned room because the collection rooms all at MCD are all air-conditioned, including the insect collections. We use face masks and later also face shields for extra protection and silicon bracket for comfort. And we maintain physical distancing at all times Pay close attention to our health and immune system, avoid fatigue by reducing work hours, and we need to go out of the room for a few minutes after working in the air-conditioned room for an hour or so. And we take extra caution, especially during lunchtime, because we were without face mask, and preferably we are alone at the time. We completed the work of first year's project in July 2020, and we had all specimens of Papillonidae digitized and mobilized. We also mobilized specimens of highly traded non papillonid butterflies, which include Cytosia, uh, Idea, and Hebomia butterflies. Despite the limitation during the pandemic, we indeed exceeded the initial target of 7,000 specimens by almost 40%. And here are examples of our data set that can be found. Here is a uh, portfolio data sets from Indonesia. And we also updated our catalog books from previously handwritten one into printed one 
withdrawal location indicated here for easy access. We managed to secure the BIFA grant for the second year. So thankful for that. And starting August 2020, we have been working on data mobilization of PD day and later also Leodine day and butterfly type specimens. Because we can only work three days a week, more assistants were hired in August and September with six persons. But later on also, we only work with four assistance due to work limitation for the space. We have been applying the same procedure as last year's BIFA project, sorting and identifying specimens of PDD and PODD, preparing QR codes and associated MCD numbers, entering data, taking photos, interpreting data, and georeferencing. We aim to accomplish the project in July 2021, but we might need to adjust the completion date to almost the end of the year, which GBIF has also anticipated. On a few occasions, our schedule was disrupted because the COVID-19 surveillance team are on emergency situation due to positive cases near our building. In those cases, we could only work uh, one time a week, once a week, and then uh, our office were disinfected once again and we can resume our work. In any case, we need to remind each other to stay fit and healthy and safe. This has been a challenging time for all of us, especially that we need to work in air-conditioned room. Nonetheless, we are very grateful to be doing this for the improvement of our butterfly collection. I express my sincere thanks to the Ministry of Environment, Government of Japan for the BIFA grant, the GBIF Secretariat and all the supporting staff, the QT of Life Science, Director of Research Center for Biology, Acting Head of NCD, in a beef, collection manager, facility manager, our project partners, my mentors, the BIFA team, and our special thanks to organizers of 2020 ECM virtual meeting. To close, I'd like to share with you this short video taken at our butterfly captive breeding facility, which was incorporated also for the project. And thank you all for watching. Um, thank you, Patty. That was an amazing talk. Um, could you elaborate a little more? Is your collection, the, your digitization collection, is that online available? Can people look at your holdings and with all your butterflies or are you planning on doing that? Yes. Hello. Uh, yes, our butterfly uh, collections is already uploaded for the Papillion uh, database already uh, on GB and our other collections will also be accessible later on. And uh, people will be uh, um, welcome also to come to our museum to visit or even like uh, get access uh, through online uh, inquiries. Thank you. And I know it's very early for you and Jade, so thanks for actually being up already and answering questions for everyone in the symposium or in the conference. Thank you. <laughs> and yeah, I've been up since uh, 11 midnight. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, so this is the end of the COVID symposium and Tommy and I would really like to thank all our speakers. We had, I think, 11 amazing talks in this symposium. And I think we learned a lot about how not only uh, institutional collections were influenced, but also private collections. And I hope that you all continue to add your name to our Google Doc and uh, your stories about what happened to you during the 
COVID um, pandemic. And we're gonna leave this document open for the next two days. So in case you didn't have a chance yet, feel free to add anything you want during the next two days. And um, yeah, um, thanks for attending and thanks for watching. But yeah, we had 11 amazing talks and the um, also the uh, museum tours this morning. So they, were, they were spectacular. So we have a lot to look forward to for tomorrow. And I'm gonna let Chris do the talking for the end of the conference, uh, day, conference day. Thank you. Yeah, that was a fantastic day, everyone. I'm really impressed with all of the talks and you know my board that worked really hard at pulling this off. So thank you, everyone. And I'm really excited about the next two days of the conference that we have left. So I look forward to seeing everyone tomorrow. And I will send out links tonight again for all of the Zoom sessions. If you have any questions or have anyone that is having trouble connecting or maybe isn't able to register yet, just let me know. We ended the day with 433 registrants, which is a fantastic thing. And I think at one point we had hit about 255, 256 people in the room at once, uh, which is another amazing number. So I look forward to tomorrow and seeing just as many people in. So thank you everyone. Have a wonderful evening.